All right, so let's talk about sort of preparation. And we're going to have three different kind of factors that we look at for a optimal kind of preparation. One is sort of the biology, right? So we're still prepping a tooth that has a nerve in it. So we'll talk about, you know, we want to minimize the trauma to the nerve. It's got to have some mechanical requirements in the sense that, well, we want that crown to stay on. So how can we design the preparation such that that crown will be kind of adhered to on the tooth, okay, without it popping off? And obviously, we want that crown to look as natural as we can, so we want an aesthetic uh, result, which comes into play with the amount of reduction that we need for a PFM crown, is if we under-prepare it, what do you think it's going to look like? It's probably going to look a little more opaque because we don't have enough room for the enamel and dentin layers to kind of cover up the opaqueness of that opaque layer. Okay? All right, so the first thing I want to talk about when it comes to biology is sort of this idea that every tooth has a nerve, right? And as people age, that nerve starts to kind of um, recede a bit. So as we're prepping, the goal here when you get to your clinical experience and prep on teeth, we want you to get to a point where you're pretty efficient with your preparations, okay? So the ideal thing is to take your biggest, fattest, coarsest burr and then grind that down as fast as you can. So you want to get about 90% of your prep kind of done very quickly. Then the remaining time you spend is with your finer grit burrs to kind of smooth out the preparation, okay? So we want to each stroke that you use to be efficient. Because one thing we're trying to do is, one, get the proper reduction, but two, minimize the insult to the tooth, right? What we see a lot of times in the clinic is, okay, we take this kind of, you know, coarse -ish or maybe a smoother burr and we're just real conservative and we'll, you know, we're afraid to take too much off, so you're gonna dibble dab with it. And pretty soon you're two hours into this preparation, we look at it and you're only halfway reduced. And we say, oh, you're only at a, you know, 0.7 millimeter occlusal reduction. You gotta like go twice as much. Okay, so now you spend another hour getting down to where you actually needed to get to, right? So all this time, every time you're taking a burr to this tooth, what do you think it's doing to that nerve? You're providing some sort of aggravating. You're in, insulting it, and eventually, if you do that enough, that nerve will actually die out, right? So uh, about five percent of all teeth that you just prepare for a crown end up in some sort of root canal just for the basis of you touching it, okay? So whenever we treat and plant crowns, we always kind of tell the patient, you know, especially if there's a cavity that has kind of encroached close to the pulp, that, hey, you may need a root canal on this tooth down the road. So that can be a common occurrence that we see, okay? So that's a biology aspect. One, well, so we're balancing a couple things. One, we got to reduce the tooth enough so that we can get our crown fabricated with sufficient strength and aesthetic requirement, but at the same time, on the other end, we don't want to do too much, otherwise you may damage the tooth or the nerve, okay? Um, if a tooth needs a root canal, then that helps solve some of that problem because you're not as worried about damaging the nerve because the nerve's already dead, okay? Uh, but again, you don't want to overreduce because then you lose some of the structural integrity of that tooth. So the more the natural tooth that you have left, the better, okay? All right, so that's what that slide just kind of designates is that, okay, you have differing teeth and then the burr contact and how long there's, there have different groups of uh, 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 burrs with water or not water. So again, when you're prepping, you want copious amount of water when you're grinding that tooth, especially when you're in your beginning steps of using your coarse burr. So we're going to answer this question, what should the uh, shape of the margin look like? So we have a buccal margin and then a lingual margin, right? So this is how we're going to separate it. One's we call it a shoulder, the other is a chamfer. Okay, a chamfer is rounded where a shoulder is flat. So in the lingual, we want a 0.5 millimeter chamfer. Remember, our 856 burr, the 016, that has a one millimeter width, okay? So not the real skinny one that we use to break interproximal contact, but the, there's another one that we have that's the same shape that's a millimeter at its tip. So if you use just half of that burr, 
guess what that margin width is there? Half a millimeter. And it's going to take on that rounded chamfer shape, right? So that's why we've chosen this burr to establish our lingual margin. And then our shoulder burr, we're going to use a full depth of it, and that's 1.2 at its tip. Okay? So it's just a definition of a chamfer finish line or a chamfer margin. So it's a finish line designed for tooth preparation in which the gingival aspect meets the external axle wall at an obtuse angle. Sorry, that's, yeah, that's for the chamfer. Um, okay, so let's talk about the chamfer, why we're using a chamfer on the lingual. So on the lingual aspect of your crown, we're okay ending that junction or that margin, so where the margin or where the crown meets the tooth, that junction is okay to be in metal because it's in an area that nobody can see. It's on the lingual aspect, right? So unless you're digging in there with a mouth mirror or they're like tip way back and laughing real big, you generally can't see the lingual aspects of your teeth, okay? So it's not an aesthetic zone, right? So thus, we're okay using metal. And because we're okay using metal, we can get the metal much thinner in that area than we would with porcelain, right? So metal is a stronger material. It's not gonna fracture on us. So because it's non-aesthetic, we're allowed to use metal and since metal is stronger, we can be more conservative. And conservative is good because we preserve tooth structure, right? We're not grinding away as much of that natural tooth. So that's the idea of the metal margin on the lingual. And the process of sealing that margin or getting the crown sealed, so if you were to compare the two different ways to form that margin, right? That metal margin is being casted through our lost wax technique, right? So we've waxed it up to a certain contour, invested it, and then we sling metal into that same shape. Whereas the porcelain, remember the video we showed how they stack the porcelain there and they have to bake it in the oven? If you were to compare the two junctions and how well it seals the tooth, the casted metal tends to do better, okay? So you get a better marginal seal less of a micro gap in that area with a metal margin. All right, then we're gonna jump to our shoulder. So this is a finished line designed for tooth preparation in which the gingival floor meets the axial, or the external axial wall at approximately a right angle, okay? So if you remember from our dental materials lecture, we know that porcelain is strongest when it is under compression but it is weak when it's under tension. So compression meaning if we just take that porcelain and push it against a flat surface, it's gonna be relatively strong there, okay? So because of that, we want a nice flat area for that porcelain to sit on, okay? So therefore, it is important to prepare a flat, smooth margin for porcelain to compress against in order to prevent fracture. The porcelain margin needs at least 1.2 millimeters of reduction because again, we need space for what? Metal, the opaque layer, and then dental enamel layers of porcelain. Okay? So we gotta be more aggressive there for the sake of aesthetics and strength. So here's a little summary slide. So uh, chamfers are obtuse angles, right? Rounded. It's usually for, it's ideally for metal margins, and then we wanna keep that at 0.5. Whereas the shoulder margin, we want at 90 degrees for porcelain, and we want to be about 1.2 millimeters. Okay. Once again, there's the shape of our margin. And these are the burrs that we're going to be using. So remember, the first um, number is just the coarseness. So you're going to use the, um, this is, the eight is the fine, six would be the coarse. Okay. So... 856016, remember the last three numbers designate the width of the burr at its shank. And it always decreases to um, 0.6 millimeters less at the tip. But since we're only using half of the width of the burr for the chamfer, that leaves us with a half millimeter margin. Okay. So here's an example of what a crown would look like from the inside. And you notice on the facial surface, this is made out of porcelain. So this area here is porcelain. And then here is metal. 
Okay? So that's how the crown looks like. Um, the coping is all metal, obviously, and then porcelain is stacked on top. So this is a view from the underside of the crown. All right, so just to summarize why we want a chamfer, uh, metal can be used in non-aesthetic areas. The chamfer is more conservative. The metal is stronger. You get a better marginal seal with metal. Porcelain is strongest under compression. The porcelain needs more reduction to hide the metal and, in a sense, the opaque layer as well. Okay? All right, so we'll dive into this a little bit more tomorrow, but one of the questions we want to answer is, well, where should the margin end? Right? So we have three differing... Uh, we have three terms that we use to describe the margin placement. One is super gingival, which just means above the gum. Equal gingival is that it's right at the gum line, and sub gingival is below the gum line. Okay? So um, maybe let's just think, well, what's an advantage of a super gingival margin? Anyone want to take a stab at that? Somebody said it was easier to clean. Yeah. You can see the junction there. You know exactly where the tooth meets. Okay. What else? More biologic width, okay, we'll get into that in a subsequent lecture, but your biologic width in your supra and equigingival, and even your sub, um, can be the same for all three. The only time that we run into violation of biologic width is if your subgingival margin goes below your sulcus depth. Okay, so we'll get into that in a bit. What else? How about your impression making? Supergingival is easier because the gums aren't in the way, right? Okay. What's the disadvantage of super gingival? Aesthetics. You can see the transition between the crown and then the tooth, right? So let's say you're using, what if you're doing a metal crown and a full gold crown? Well, who cares about the aesthetics, right? Because it's already a gold crown, so you've already lost that battle, right? So you may as well make your life a little easier, make it more cleansable, easier to make an impression, because um, you know, it's already not tooth colored, so who cares, right? Equi gingival. So you want to add the gum line. Right? So it's sort of right in between, you know, it has some advantages of the supra, some of the advantages of the subgingival, where you can kind of hide your margin, but you don't want that margin to recede any, otherwise it'll be exposed. Um, somewhat easier to clean than a subgingival margin, right? But not as easy as a supra. How about for a subgingival margin? Sometimes we're forced into placing a subgingival margin because the decay has gone below the gum line. So we obviously want to remove that decay tooth structure so that the crown has something solid for it to sit on. Okay, so sometimes we're chasing the caries below the gum line. And at some point, if the caries goes too far below the gum line, right, and that's where we get into the biologic width um, term. So again, we'll jump into that later. But you may get so deep where it's not a good idea to place a crown on that as is. We're going to have to modify that in some way. But the subgenital margin is best to kind of hide any junction that you have, okay? Um, but it's not as ideal because it's harder to make impression because you've got to push the tissue out of the way, and it's harder to clean, and it's harder to check to see if everything's sealed or if decay has, you know, sprung up later on. Because sometimes we'll get recurrent decay underneath the crown. Okay? For our purposes in the Sim Clinic, our ideal is to keep you half a millimeter above the free gingival margin, okay? So this is to protect our gingival margin from being nicked by your burrs, okay? In the clinic, the margin placement will be based on your clinical situation. So you'll work with your clinical instructors to determine what, where you should end your margin, okay? All right, so let's get into some of these terms. So this is the mechanical properties that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about retention form. So think of retention form as, well, here's the definition. That quality inherent in, dental, in a dental prosthesis acting to resist the forces of dislodgement parallel to the path of placement. So in other words, how hard or how difficult it is to pull the crown off along the path of placement. Okay? So parallel to the long axis or parallel to the um, path of placement. This is assuming that you've prepped the crown along the long axis of the tooth, right? And if we're to compare that to another term, okay, so here's the diagram. So when you pull straight up, how well does that resist dislodgement, okay? We're going to contrast that a bit with resistance form, 
which is the feature of a tooth perforation that enhances the stability of a restoration and resists dislodgement along an axis other than the path of placement. So you can think of this as any tipping or rotating force. Basically, instead of pulling it straight down, you're trying to roll that crown off. So if you take your finger and, let's say, push on the buccal cusp, will that crown roll off your preparation? Or, does, so if a crown has good resistance form, the walls of your prep will prevent that crown from rotating off, okay? Know the difference between retention versus resistance form. So some of the uh, contributing factors, they overlap, but there's a distinct difference in the definition, okay? Because we're going to ask the question, well, what factors influence the retention and resistance form? And what I'm saying here is that the factors that influence one will probably also affect the other, okay? And the first concept that we're going to talk about is total occlusal convergence. Another way, another way to, um, that this term is used is what we call taper, okay? So it's the angle measured in degrees formed between opposing axial walls when a tooth or teeth are prepared for crowns or fixed dental prostheses. Fancy word for bridges. So crowns or bridges, okay? So if we were to look at this crown prep, right? And if we were to, so these lines designate the path of insertion, okay? This one happens to be, you know, somewhat ideally prepped, so it's along the long axis of the tooth. And let's pretend we're able to put a protractor there and just measure the angle of that prep in relation to the path of insertion. So let's say we get eight and 10. So our total occlusal convergence, or taper, is going to be 18 degrees, okay? So we want our crown prep to be more narrow at the top than it is at the base, okay? So the reason for that is, well, we need to be able to, remember after we make our um, impression, we're going to pour it in stone, and we're going to do our wax up procedure, right? What do we do after the crown has been waxed up and checked for all the appropriate contacts? We have to invest it, right? Well, how do you, you need at some point then take off the wax from the dye so that you can invest it. And when I say dye, D-I-E, remember that just means the stone replica of your tooth, okay? So, right, you add wax to the dye and eventually that dye needs to come off. So you need those walls to lean in a bit Otherwise, you won't be able to lift your crown off. Okay? All right, so this is also referred to as taper. And the best way to examine taper is to look at the crown prep straight down the long axis, okay? And to also close one eye so you can really see and try to uh, see the walls of your preparation, your axial walls. Sometimes when we're looking at uh, work on certain teeth, you won't be able to get direct vision. So if you can't use direct vision, well, this is where indirect vision helps. So you've got to angle the mirror in such a way that you can visualize the tooth down the long axis. Okay? So for tooth number 30, that's going to be critical to use indirect vision to sight down exactly down the long axis of the tooth or the path of placement. This will help determine your taper, okay? So um, what helps us establish the taper is actually the natural contour of the burr, okay? So we know the burr is wider at the top as the bottom, so it has a natural taper to it. So I've gone through and done the math for you. I was a little bored last night, okay? So you'll notice there's a 0.3 millimeter difference towards the tip in each direction, right? So you gotta take the inverse tangent of this, right? So the shank of the burr, the cutting part is eight millimeters, and then the uh, difference at the tip is 0.3 on each side. So thus, remember your trigonometry? Your angle is gonna be inverse tangent 0.3 over eight, 2.14 degrees, okay? All right, so which means that our burr is naturally tapered at two, two degrees, okay? So for, um, to kind of visualize this, if you were to move um, your minute hand or your second hand or whatever, one minute, let's say, to um, advance from noon, that is a five and a half degree taper. 
So that's sort of a visual to see about how much 2 degrees is. Well, it's half of what a minute hand would be when it's placed at one minute. Okay? So that's pretty steep. So for our sim clinic purposes, what we're going to shoot for is a 10 degree occlusal taper. Total occlusal convergence. So five degrees on each side, we're going to try to achieve 10. So retention is affected by <clears throat> our total occlusal convergence or taper. So an easy way to understand this is um, if you were to ever pick up some red solo cups, right? Sometimes they stick together. Why is it that they stick together? Well, the walls are pretty parallel, so they engage each other, right? There's a minimal path, uh, or there's not as many different ways in which that crown can be separated or differing paths of withdrawal. So thus, they tend to stick together. Whereas if you pick up a stack of party hats, those almost never stick together. And why is that? Because the walls are leaned in, right? There's many directions in which you can pull that top hat off of, OK? So we know that the more parallel you are, the better, the better retention form you're going to have. More parallel walls will also lead to better resistance, right? You're also going to get less tipping force, OK? Because the crown will eventually bump into the wall of the tooth, and then it won't rotate off, right? All right, so we want to keep the tooth as parallel as we can, but we actually don't want it to be like zero degrees. Why don't we want it perfectly parallel? Well, it may be so parallel that you can't even seat it down fully, because remember, at some point, <clears throat> you have to fill that crown with cement, right? So if you seat that crown and there's like zero room there, well, that cement may end up holding your crown up because it doesn't have enough room for that cement to flow out of in order for you to seat that crown fully down. So this is you know, um, kind of a diagram to show ideal taper, where the top part is just a little bit more narrow than your bottom. So this is a cross section. So between your red and blue line, you should be able to see down and see a little bit of that wall all the way through on all the surfaces. Okay? That means that you have a well-tapered restoration. If the two lines meet, what do you think that means? Let's say you can't see the bottom red line. They're either perfectly parallel or you have an undercut where this is actually angled this way and then you have a little bit that's hidden there. Okay? Now this is an example of a tooth that's probably over tapered. Look at that angle. So when you look straight down your tooth, look at the dis difference between the top of the prep towards the bottom. You're going to see your wall, your axial wall, and it's going to be much wider from this view than from this view. Okay? So as you guys prepare your teeth, take your mirror, position it so you can sight down the long axis of the tooth or the path of placement, and you're going to look at the top of your prep and compare that to the junction of the bottom of your prep, the axial wall to the margin. Right, so this line here, this pink one, and see how wide that separation is. You want to keep that so it's present, but to a minimum. Okay? All right, this is what we know about taper. It's not a linear relationship as you compare it to retention. So when you get to about 30 degree taper, look how much your retention drops off. So if you were to measure retention in terms of megapascals, how much force it requires for you to remove the two pieces together, you can see that as your taper increases, it exponentially decreases the retention of it. Okay. All right, let's get into resistance form. right? So when we talk about resistance form, we also want to pay attention to the height to base ratio of the tooth. That's going to have an effect on describing how easy it is for that crown to be dislodged or rotated off. So the taller the tooth you have, is that going to be better for resistance form or worse? Better, right? Taller walls prevent the crown from rotating off. Okay? So maybe this picture will be a little bit easier to see that. So um, if you look at the top picture, you'll notice that that prep is taller than the bottom. 
And then you can think of a crown that's sitting on here and pretend we're going to rotate it off of um, the tooth from this point of rotation. So as you rotate the crown off, if it's a short wall, well, this part will bypass this tooth structure and it'll end up being able to roll off. Whereas if you have a taller wall, okay, then eventually that crown is going to hit the tooth right there and it's going to prevent it from rotating off of the tooth. Okay, you guys with me? So the taller the wall, the better, right? And then same, how about for the, and I don't have a picture of it here, but let's think in our heads, okay? Let's say we kept the height of the prep the same. So you have two preps, same height. One is narrow, so imagine the base being real narrow, and imagine the second prep, your base is really wide. Which is going to be preferential to our resistance form? So the narrower your crown is, the steeper the angle in which that's going to rotate off of, which means it's going to bump into your axial wall much more quickly, thus preventing it from rotating off. Whereas if you have a much wider base, think of the arc that that forms, right? And that's going to be much easier for it to be dislodged. So if you were to think about our, let's compare anterior teeth to posterior teeth. Which teeth will naturally have better resistance form? Anterior teeth, because they're taller and a little bit more narrow. Okay. Um, this idea of an undercut, let me just define it first. Any irregularity in the wall of a prepared tooth that prevents the withdrawal or seating of a wax pattern or casting. So remember we talked about the steps in making a crown is to wax up the tooth and eventually take off that wax pattern so that you can invest and cast it. Right. So if you can't even take the wax off of the die, how the hell are you going to invest it? You can't, right? So either the wax is going to break, uh, well, that's probably going to happen if you force that wax off. Okay? So imagine you have prepared this tooth and you got a little divot. You see that little divot there? right? So let's say we make an impression and pour that into stone. So pretend this is a stone cast. right? Then we're going to add wax to this, right? We dip it in that little wax reservoir so that you have a coping and we start waxing onto it. And we wax up our wax pattern. Are we able to pull this wax pattern off of the die without it breaking? No, right? So if we go back, our impression material is able to capture this because what do we know about our impression material? It's elastic. What does elastic mean? Yeah, so it's able to return back to its original form, right? So, um, PVS, polyvinyl siloxane, is our impression material. That's an elastic material. It's able to go in and capture the detail of that little divot, but as you take it off, it's able to flex over it and then return back to its original form. Okay? What do we know about wax? We categorize that as an inelastic material, meaning that thing's not going to flex. So if that doesn't flex, that's basically locked into it onto that die. Right? We won't be able to remove that from the stone cast. So what if we had something like that in real life? Well, what are our options? So the wax app is not able to be removed without it breaking because it's locked into the undercut. Okay? So if you still had the patient in the chair and you noticed that, well, one way to correct that is to block it out with some sort of, let's say, composite material. So you'll etch bond and then add composite to that. Okay? So that little thing there represents composite. Okay. And then, then you can make your impression and then that problem is solved. If, let's say, you didn't notice it and it goes to the lab, well, the lab is looking at this stone die and it's got this little divot. Well, what they can do is add a little bit of acrylic in that area. So we call that a block out. We can block out the undercut. So if we add a little acrylic in that area, well, now the subsequent wax up can now be removed without breaking. Let's think about what that wax up is going to look like, right? And then we're going to be able to withdraw that wax pattern because the undercut is eliminated, right? So what happens more commonly isn't so much a divot because those are easy to be identified, right? What's more common though is that if we try to make our preparation like too parallel, we have a tendency to put in this undercut by the way that we hold the burr, right? Or if we just lose track of our path of placement, sometimes we'll tip our burr 
so that the tip is digging into the tooth where the top of it isn't really grinding it. So you're going to introduce um, a divergent wall there. Okay. So you may end up something with a prep that looks like this. Again, this is still an undercut, except it just kind of extends all the way down into the margin. So if we were to, this is our proposed path of placement of our crown. We notice a gap at that margin, right? Well, if this happens, the lab technically can still block out that area, right? You can still make an impression that mimics this. So let me take a step back. If you left it alone, you're not able to remove this undercut. You're not able to remove this wax pattern because of that undercut. So, but like I was saying, the lab, if you send that to the lab in the stone cast form, they can add a little acrylic that fills in that space there. So that now when you add the wax pattern to it, you're able to withdraw that prosthesis. Okay? But what's the disadvantage of that? So if you pay attention to the width of the uh, margin there, Notice that our marginal width is decreased, right? So pretend that's a shoulder margin that we wanted. And originally we wanted how wide of a margin there? 1.2. So if we had to block out and undercut in that region, guess how wide your buckle margin is not? It's not 1.2. It's going to be less than that, which then poses an issue, right? What's the issue here? What may happen? Either your porcelain may fracture because it's thin, or it's going to look, or and it'll look opaque because you have less room for your kind of good looking porcelain. That opaque layer is shining through. Okay? Or even some of the darkness of the metal may be showing through too. Okay? So this is why a, you know, even though you can argue that, okay, I can still make a crown that draws, you know, so when we say path of withdrawal, path of placement, those are similar terms. It's still the path that you're going in. Or draw, sometimes you'll hear us just say, oh, you don't, your prep doesn't draw, meaning we can't lift it up. Okay. Um, so even though you can make it draw by blocking it out, you've compromised potentially the marginal width. Okay? And it requires more lab work from, you know, the more steps you do introduce into here, the less, or the more opportunity for errors to be introduced in this crown fabrication process. All right? So the other thing too is not only is your margin less, but imagine when you seat the crown, well, what's going to happen? You're going to have a little gap there. It'll get filled in with cement, but now your cement gap is much larger. So potentially it may influence your retention and resistance form because the crown isn't well adapted and it's not really touching that crown in that area, right? So that's another principle to understand. Okay, so here's another example. Okay, when the undercut is present, it may appear possible to remove the wax pattern by changing the path of withdrawal. So instead of removing the crown straight up and down, well, why can't we just remove it from the side at an angle like that, right? Well, what we have to also consider is the fact that that doesn't exist in a vacuum. You have bring teeth next to it, okay? So if you were to try to remove the crown in that orientation, you would find that, well, the neighboring teeth block it from being able to be removed or placed, however you want to think about it, right? So really the solution there is to upright and relieve that undercut so that you have the proper path of withdrawal. So that not only does it draw in relation to the opposing or the opposite axial wall, but it's also got to draw so that it doesn't bump into the interproximal contacts of your neighboring teeth. Okay, so if you prep that like that, then we can lift that up and it'll draw. Okay, so undercuts are bad, right? So how do we look for undercuts? Well, again, you're going to sight down the long axis, right? Position your mirror so you can look straight down. And you want to be able to see some part of your wall all the way around. One little trick is you can take your tip of your explorer, 
and then walk it around the junction of the margin in your axial wall. Okay? And as you move that explorer around, if that explorer tip disappears, what do you think you have there? You have an undercut, right? Because the top of the tooth is blocking your view of that explorer tip. That means the width at the bottom is less than the width of the top. And wherever you have that happen, you won't be able to get the wax to withdraw from there. Okay? So undercuts, um, a pretty key concept and um, something to really watch out for. Because it's one of those things where we, you know, your prep may look great, but if you got an undercut somewhere, unfortunately, we won't be able to make a crown. You know, at the end of the day, your patient's coming in because you want to give them a crown. But if you prepared it um, incorrectly, we can't accomplish it. Whereas some of the other errors may not be ideal, like if you overreduce, let's say, right? All right, it's not ideal that you ground away too, so much tooth structure, but you can still make a crown off of that preparation. Okay.